turn it over to Lee Rogers to explain what the procedure is for this forum. And um, Lee, he has his own microphone and everything, and so I'll let him take it from here. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This will be our candidate forum part of the uh, program tonight. Uh, candidates, if you would, I want to uh, appreciate if you could be seated in the air of uh, the order that I'm fixing to call out here from South Carolina Senate District 3 incumbent Kevin Bryant. If you please come have a seat, Senator. And his challenger, Don Bowen Jr. From South Carolina Senate District 4, the incumbent Billy O'Dell. And his challenger, Riley Harbell. From South Carolina House District 8, the incumbent Don Bowen Sr. His challenger, Ted Luckadoo. And challenger, Jonathan Walker. And South Carolina, <clears throat> excuse me, South Carolina House District 10, the incumbent Joshua Putnam. And challenger, Hamp Johnson. If y'all have a seat, please. Thank you. <coughs> excuse me. Hey, Lee. Yes, sir. Can I unplug my phone from the checker? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to get a text. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. The way things are, are going to work tonight is that I have... Um, a series of questions that we will be asking of all the candidates, all of these initial questions pertain to state government, uh, obviously the legislature, and we will do this for each candidate. You'll have one minute to respond uh, to that question. If you, in answering that question, make reference to your direct opponent, I will give that opponent 30 seconds for rebuttal. Um, I'll be keeping track of the time here. I will give you a few seconds leeway. I'll try to allow you to uh, conclude your sentences, but uh, we obviously with so many candidates and uh, a limited amount of time, I'd appreciate it if you would try to help us move the clock along and, and cooperate uh, with the time constraints, if you would, please. Um, first off, we'll start with opening remarks. We'll give one minute to each candidate. Then we'll get to the question period where we will have one minute for answers and 30 seconds for rebuttal. Uh, then we'll also give you one minute for closing remarks. After that, there'll be a short time of uh, fellowship and biscuits, I understand is what's on the menu tonight. Uh, during that time, and, and ladies and gentlemen, for you in the audience, many of you may have found this small piece of paper like this. This, if you, if you are a president or executive committee of a precinct, only those folks are, are asked to fill these out. If you are a president or executive committee of your precinct, please put your name and the precinct name there as well. And um, the, the candidate for whom the question is intended and write your question here. And I do ask that you try to keep it to questions pertaining certainly <coughs> exactly to things that pertain to the office that these uh, gentlemen will be um, contesting. After the fellowship time, uh, we'll take a series of these questions. I believe there's some young ladies that are going to be collecting those during that time, during that break. And I'll go over those and um, try to find out how many um, questions we have that may be similar to try to um, get an opportunity to ask the most asked question and do as many of those as we have and we'll have a similar one minute time limit on those as well. So we will go ahead and uh, get started with opening remarks and just remember folks I'm going to turn this cordless mic on and it will always be on so <laughs> didn't want to surprise anybody. We'll start off with opening remarks with um, Senator Kevin Bryant. Thank you Lee. I, I have a feeling of what's going on here. It's tax day, and you're lining up a bunch of politicians. Is this some kind of fire line? I'm Kevin Bryant, and it's been an honor to serve you in the South Carolina Senate. My involvement in politics started just like you, a conservative activist. And I still consider myself a conservative activist. As conservative, conservative activists, we expect our elected officials not only to vote very conservatively, but to engage in the debate, to fight for what's good and to fight against what's bad. I've been in several fights. I've been in lots of fights. I'm going to highlight a few that I have down in Columbia. The very first fight I chose to take on was very difficult. I was a freshman, and I took on the bold step that child rapists in South Carolina would get the death penalty. I held the floor several hours. I was told by liberals in the Senate that you can't do this. See, they didn't want to vote against it, even Time. though... Time. Time? One minute for opening remarks. I'm sorry. I'm Kevin Bryant. It's good to be here tonight. <laughs> and now, Challenger Don Bowen, Jr., one minute for opening remarks. 
My name is Don Bowen Jr. Um, that's my wife in the back of the room, Michelle Bowen. She's a public school teacher at Calhoun Elementary. Um, I'm up here tonight for a lot of the same reasons that Senator Bryant just spoke of. I'm here to have some debate. I'm here to um, fight over the issues that are important to me, that are important to my family, and important to my children. And I appreciate all of you coming out tonight. I look forward to a respectful debate with Senator Bryant. And uh, that'll be all for now. All right, thank you very much. Now for Senate District 4, the incumbent Billy O'Dell. One minute. Thank you, Lee. I'm Billy O'Dell, and I represent Senate District 4. Uh, regarding my interest in politics, I've been involved from, from an early age. Early I was elected as a deacon in my church, and when my children were in elementary school, I ran for the board of trustees and was elected to two terms. Then I went to uh, the college level and ran for the board at the Citadel, where I graduated, and was elected to two terms there. After that, I came to the, decided to run for the Senate, because I was concerned about the regulations that were being placed in my business. And uh, I have worked diligently to try to prevent some of these regulations. I intend to continue to try to help business in any manner I can. And that is one reason that I would like to continue my service. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and look forward to speaking to you later. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator. Challenger Riley Harbell. Good evening. Uh, my name is Riley Harvell, and I'm running for the South Carolina Senate. Uh, the reason I'm running is very simple. Uh, there are very big problems facing our state, uh, very big decisions that have to be made in the next few years about the future of our state, the future of the state that, that my, my family and, and my children stand to inherit. And those, those, those decisions and those problems and the solutions to those problems are things that I believe my generation should have a say in. I firmly believe that as the generation that stands to inherit the state, we should have a say in the decision-making process. And if, if we fail to stand up and we fail to put our names forward, uh, then that can never happen. Uh, I'm running because I want to provide real solutions for the big problems that are facing our state, and I hope that I'll have your support. Thank you. Thank you. On South Carolina House District 8, the incumbent Don Bowen Sr. I'm Don Bowen Sr. The first time I stood before y'all, to make a presentation, I forgot to tell y'all what my name was. So this time I always say my name before I get started. I, I ran, the way I got into office was I, I ran a property tax movement across the state. Everybody was was very discontent with the way our property was being taxed. And we got, we raised $250,000, got 358,000 emails. I spoke in every county in the state, wore out one car and uh, spent two years down in Columbia, and they won't let me count that towards retirement either. I work on, I serve on the State Education Committee, and I serve on it by request. This year, if, I'm, if, if the current K-12 subcommittee chair is retiring, and I'm next in line to be chairman of the K-12 subcommittee. Education, jobs are a major issue. Education is, is right up there with jobs. And I have water issues, about three different kinds that I work on all the time. I never have a free moment, and thank you for your time. All right, and uh, Challenger, Ted Luckadoo. Good evening. I, uh, most of you know me as Coach Luckadoo. I'm Ted Luckadoo. I've uh, been in education for the last 40 years and, and, and retiring as of Friday. Uh, this is something that I've wanted to do for years, and because of the job I had, I was not able to do that. But I am uh, very interested in, in people. I've always worked with people. And I look forward to uh, this campaign and, and trying to help the people of Anderson County and the, the people of South Carolina. Thank you. All right, thank you. Challenger Jonathan Walker. Good evening. Um, let me begin. I'm Jonathan Walker. Let me thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, first, a little bit about me. I grew up in District 8. I'm running for House District 8. Um, went to Pendleton High School, which is a public school, graduated from Clemson University. And uh, I've always been interested in politics, and I believe that we have a lot of issues currently as far as the economy, the school system, and uh, the South Carolina government that really need to be addressed. And that's uh, the main reason I'm running. I just figured it was time to uh, step up and quit talking about things. So that's why I'm running for House District 8. Thank you all. Thank you. Now for South Carolina House District 10, the incumbent, Joshua Putnam. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to stand before you. 
Um, this will be the fifth election within two years I've ran for. Um, and, and it truly is. It truly is an honor to represent you every single day in Columbia, to stand for the conservative message. And we, we, have a conserv we have a Republican majority in the House, but oftentimes we don't have a conservative majority by no means. It's been eye-opening, but also a privilege to serve down there. To stand for your privileges, or stand for your views and your values in Columbia, and to carry on that fight, and to work with Senator Bryant, and to send out different pieces of legislation. But we have a tremendous fight of, in front of us. This November is going to completely change the outcome of this country, I feel. And we got to get involved. Just sitting back here, coming to a meeting, hearing a few things, isn't going to cut it anymore. You've got to get out there. We've got to work for conservatives. I'm proud to stand for the conservative record I have in the House. Been there for every single vote. Time. There we go. <laughs> and this challenger, Hamp Johnson. Good evening. I'm Hamp Johnson. I'm running for the House District 10 race. And I'm running for really one reason. That's the future of my children. We're saddled with debt. We're saddled with taxes. We're saddled with things that our children are going to pay for, my children are going to pay for, for years and years and years. I want to go to Columbia, eliminate waste first and foremost. Our future depends on it. These are things that are important to me, important to my family, and I believe important to the folks in Anderson District 10 and within Anderson County too as well. On a footnote, last thing, man, isn't it great that the Republican Party is kicking the Democrats? How many of them are running against us? Very few. That speaks to the movement within the county and the great job that y'all are doing supporting and promoting the conservative values within our county. I'm Hamp Johnson. I appreciate your support. All right, thank you. <laughs> just hand it to Senator Bryant. We'll just keep going this way. All right, first question, um, and I'll have a little bit of an introduction to this, and I'll try to keep this brief. The Department of Employment and Workforce reports that seasonally adjusted unemployment for February was 9.1% in South Carolina. The inflation rate that the federal government reports is 2.87%, but that does not include food and energy. And speaking of energy, gasoline in South Carolina as of right now is averaging $3.70 a gallon. State employee retirement fund is underfunded by several billion dollars. With all that information, how can state legislators justify a 2012-2013 state budget that may include a $1 billion in new spending? One minute. What? It took longer than a minute to read that exactly. question. <laughs> First thing, unemployment. I chaired a committee that would automatically disqualify fired workers for misconduct. That will lower unemployment taxes on our employers $50 million or more. And the best way to create jobs is to lower the overhead of the job creators. You spoke about debt. I'm going to tell you one more thing about debt. There is a wonderful project that we have to fund, and that's dredging the Charleston port. Everybody here would agree with that. But the bill before us borrows the money. We've got $32 billion of debt on our grandchildren, and here we have a bill that takes a great idea and wants to borrow the money. Here's the greatest trick in the book politicians will do. They'll take something very popular, they'll borrow money or raise taxes to fund that, and then they'll, behind your back, fund the fluffy stuff and the warm and fuzzy and the pork barrel spending. I will fight that. I will continue to fight that. I joined a filibuster of the budget last year. It paid for abortions, paid down little debt, and, and cut hardly any taxes. And we drug that budget process out five weeks. And if I'm reelected, I'll do Time. the same thing again. All right, now, Challenger, Don Bowen, Jr. I feel like that the, um, the issues with unemployment can be addressed um, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And they're one of the most important um, issues that we're faced with. We've got to cut. The, the wastes in government that um, help to that, that preclude businesses from getting out there and being profitable. Um, I've run a small business before, and I've gone out there and realized how much time that I've got to spend just meeting all the obligations that the government puts on small business. Those obligations hurt our ability to go out and create jobs. With 10% unemployment, I'm not sure if that's in South Carolina as a whole, or even here within just the county of Anderson. I believe it's higher than that here in Anderson. Could be in Anderson. We need to work here within Anderson County, also making a, a, a political environment that's more conducive to new business coming into our area. And uh, showing people who want to come in and invest money in Anderson County that we have a, we have a political machine in place that's going to work with them and not against them. Thank you. 
All right, and I will restate the question briefly and not go through the whole setup. Once again, how can the state legislators justify the 2012-2013 state budget that may include a $1 billion of new spending? Senator O'Dell. Leah, uh, the $1 billion that you're speaking about, we only have about $400 million of new money coming in. $500 million is already obligated for but, uh, money that went in the budget last year, the reoccurring money. So we don't really have a billion dollars to spend. That's a fallacy that the, 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 the newspaper likes to put out, but that's not true. It's not in new money. We've got about $400 million, and of that, $180 million is obligated to dredge the ports in Charleston. I think this is one of the most important things that we can do in the state. We've got to dredge the ports, and this is not borrowed money. This is money in the budget, uh, the, current, the House budget. <clears throat> and I think if we do not get that port dredged and continue Charleston as the number one port, we're going to lose industry. I was in a Michelin, Michelin uh, announcement this past week, and they indicated they would not be in the state if the ports of Charleston was not there. So we have allowed the Savannah port to come in and take the lead, and we're going to have to do what I have to do to stop it. All right, thank you. Challenger Riley Harbeck. Okay, thank you, Lee. Um, I like this question because this question drives at the point uh, that I've been trying to get out throughout this entire campaign, why I'm running. I'm running because the problem is we are trying to justify new spending in the budget. When we're talking about rising unemployment rates, low, losing jobs in the state, we're talking about massive amounts of inflation, more inflation coming down the pipe for my generation and my children's generation. When we talk about these problems, and then we have a state legislature that's spending more money this year than it did last year, when, we're, when our state's trying to come out of a recession, when we're trying to inspire small business and empower small business to create jobs, and yet we're going to spend more money on the state level, it seems wrong. And these are the decisions, these are the, the problems that I'm talking about, and, and the solutions that I have, a minute is nowhere near long enough to get into it. So hopefully I'll have the opportunity to meet all of you after this, and, and we can discuss it further. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now for South Carolina House District 8, the incumbent Don Bowen Sr. And um, Congress, or Representative, the question once again is how can the state legislature justify that 2012-2013 state budget that may include, may include $1 billion in new spending? You also said that there was 9% unemployment. That's not really an accurate figure. 9% is what they have on the current rolls out there. We're really closer to 15% when you take those people who have rolled and off and passed their benefits period. So we're really much worse off than, than those figures that the state puts out would indicate. The thing that we've got to do is we've got to lessen the burden on our businesses. We, we put, uh, I went to that same opening that Mr. O'Dell went to with, with Michelin coming in here. We've got to start incentivizing businesses to come here. The only way that we're going to get out of this recession that we're in is to create jobs and work our way out and manage our way out. We've got a lot of money that we can reroute and put it to, to a much more meaningful end than we are now, especially in our school system. I've got a program where I've been working, I've been to 30-something different school districts since January, and we're trying to work up where you can get your first year of college paid for with the dual credit system. And then we can work with the technical system and get, not only do you graduate with the degree, you graduate with meaningful job training too. Thank you. Right, and the challenger, Ted Lockerbie. Concerning the budget, I know each and every one of you are sitting here probably know something that, that you've seen in the budget that needs to be taken out. I think as a, a legislator, we, we need to look at taking the, the fat out, uh, getting rid of programs that we don't necessarily need. But as far as the unemployment, I think it's a big thing in this state. And I think the reason that we, we have that is because we don't educate people enough. We need to do a better job of educating people so that when, when, job, when people come to this state with their companies, they look at our workforce, know that it's, it's a good workforce, they're educated, and they're able to take the jobs that are offered. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Challenger Jonathan Walker. As far as the extra spending, I strongly disagree with that. Um, the first thing is we've got to create jobs. The easiest way to do that is small business. We've got to lessen the rules and regulations on small businesses so they can expand, grow, increase their profits, and add new employees. That's, that's the heart of South Carolina, is the people. And we have got to cut the def deficit, excuse me. Um, and uh, 
like I said, the best way is to create jobs. And I'm not in favor of this extra billion dollars in spending. And um, job creation is number one thing to fix that. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now for South Carolina House District 10, the incumbent Joshua Putnam. And once again, the question, how can the state legislature justify the state budget that may include a billion dollars in new spending? The problem is we have too many politicians in Columbia. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, we have too many good old boys down there. The face of budget, I think we got to rethink. we got to think outside the box. I think we got to go to a zero-based budgeting system. I think you start at zero every single year and have to, to prove to me, well, does your organization really need $100 million? Does your organization really need $2 million? And you prove if it has merit, and then we'll decide if we're going to fund it. I think that's what we got to move to, zero-based budgeting. You mentioned gas and how it's um, increasing. I have a joint resolution to the President of the United States to light the fire underneath him because he is doing absolutely nothing with um, natural gas and offshore oil production. And the, the joint resolution has actually passed the House Committee. It's on the calendar, and we should have a vote this Wednesday. Uh, it's been on the calendar for a few weeks now. We've been out. But we've got to stand strong, guys. I mean, this just sitting down and everything and saying, you know what? Let's let it go to $5 and not doing anything. That's unacceptable. So it's time for us to start fighting. All right, thank you. And Challenger Hank Johnson. Plain and simple, in my opinion, last three years in the state of South Carolina, just in two programs, Medicaid, the Senator Bryant has championed into unemployment, we've wasted, down the drain, $760 million. And basically for all, benefits that should not have been paid. This is where we need to start, is with the waste. If we cut this waste, then the tax cuts that we put in place will enable our businesses to grow. Then we won't need to increase our budget by a billion dollars. Cut the waste first, audit the state agencies, every one of them, find out where the waste is, and then let's set our budget accordingly. No tax increase is going to, or tax decrease, is going to be effective as long as we have the waste. That will basically enable our small businesses to grow by reducing the unemployment taxes. That will enable industry to come into South Carolina too as well that we don't have right now. So those are things we need to do. All right, thank you. All right. Okay, now on to our second question. Uh, we've mentioned the uh, Michelin thing, which obviously I'm, I'm certain everybody in the county is happy to see happening. But in the light of the $75 million that the state is talking about spending for infrastructure improvements for the Michelin plants, both in Anderson and Lexington counties, and projects such as the dredging of Charleston Harbor, are state expenditures and tax incentives that lure industry to our area a good deal for taxpayers? One minute for Senator Kevin Bryant. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. I've always opposed retail tax incentives. Retail tax incentives are... Let's say uh, a, a retailer wanted to come up and put a store across from Kmart. We give them a tax break to compete with their competitor across the street who's funding their competition. That's why I have opposed retail tax incentives. Some of these other incentives I do favor, these infrastructure needs that Michelin needs, I, I believe is a very good thing. I believe the tax incentive package that we gave Boeing is a good thing. The problem is, it's recently been turned out by a, a study, is South Carolina has the least transparent incentive process in the country. That's a problem. When we're giving these countries your money to bring them here, you ought to know everything that we're doing. That is something that we've got to change, and after this study came out, I think we do have the momentum to change. Not exactly whether we do incentives or not, but we need to make it transparent for when you're spending money, you need to know where it's going. Time. Thank you. And uh, Challenger, Don Bowen, Jr. The issue of tax incentives to attract investment in South Carolina is something I've spoken with a lot of my friends about over the years. Uh, you got to realize that when, a, when an entrepreneur comes out there with his own investment capital and he decides, I'm going to take some risk on and I'm going to start a new business, they're going to look for the, the state that allows them the most advantageous political climate and tax climate um, to help adjust that risk-reward ratio when they make their decision on where they're going to start up a company. Um, I'm in favor of, of South Carolina being competitive with Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and, and all the other surrounding states uh, when it comes to providing tax incentives. I think we need to look closely at what the other states are doing and make sure that our policies here in South Carolina 
remain competitive for the good of the people here in South Carolina. All right, thank you. Uh, now for Senate uh, District 4, the incumbent Billy O'Dell, and um, Senator, the question once again talking about the state expenditures and tax incentive flooring industry, are they good for the taxpayer? I think they are, they are a good investment for the taxpayers because the problem we have with the attracting industry in the state, we have the highest uh, profit tax on industry in any place in the country. It's ten and a half percent. So the only way we can compensate and attract industry to come to this area is all from incentives. Until we change that tax structure, we're, we're going to have to do incentives. And I think, uh, particularly with Michelin, first quality, people like that, we were able to bring into this area. If we had not had the incentives, they weren't going to come. They're not going to come for smiling faces and beautiful places. It's an investment for them. It's business. And they know what the bottom line is. So until we can do some changing with our tax structure, I support incentives. I think, again, the port is the most important thing that we can accomplish in the next session. Thank you, Senator. And challenger, Riley Harvell. Okay, I'm going to bump the curve here a little bit. I don't think that economic incentives are a good deal for South Carolina. Uh, in fact, I believe that they're what I would call a band-aid, a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Our state has a lot of long-term problems, and I think our need for economic incentives reveals one of these, and it's our unfair tax code. We have to change the tax code, and I agree with Senator Bryant that we should make the economic incentives deals more transparent for the sole purpose of showing the public the general public, how ridiculous these things are. What great breaks big companies are getting and the advantage they now have over little companies to put small businesses out of business. I don't think economic incentives are a good deal for South Carolina. And if I was elected, I would go to the Senate and I would fight against them. I would fight to lower the tax rate and make South Carolina overall a more competitive place for big business and small business alike. Now, um South Carolina House District 8, the incumbent Don Bowen Sr. And uh, Representative, once again, we're talking about the state expenditures and tax incentives lowering industry to the area. I think that we have to offer incentives to be competitive, especially with our tax structure as it is. I can remember when BMW came here and I looked at all the incentives they got, and we've had the time to see what's happened with BMW. BMW has been a success story for us. They brought all kinds of peripheral businesses here to the state. We need to do what we have to do, regardless of how, how, what kind of incentives we get, to get businesses here in South Carolina and ultimately put people back to work. The only way that we're going to solve this problem with this recession is by working our way out of it. And we can't work our way out of it if we don't have jobs for people. So I'm 100% behind incentives for people coming to work here. We've got to be as competitive as everybody else and we'll win, we're smart enough, we can put our heads together, and we can get the businesses here in South Carolina. BMW has proven that. Thank you. Thank you. Challenger Ted Buckley. I certainly agree with the, uh, and, and, and as uh, Senator Bryant said, they are good and they are bad. Uh, I do agree that uh, you have to look at the tax incentive you offer people. I think if you have a company in this town, for example, and you've been here for 30 years and we bring somebody in who does the same thing you do, you didn't get a tax break. I think we have to look at those kind of things. As far as the big businesses, we have to offer incentives to get the jobs in South Carolina, to get the jobs in Anderson County, and so I would certainly support that. All right, thank you. Challenger, Jonathan Walker. I believe that uh, the incentives are great uh, for the state. First off, it uh, brings jobs to us. Uh, we're talking about first quality. It brought a lot of uh, jobs for small businesses, which helped drive, drive the economy. Another thing for the ports, um, South Carolina Port has gone uh, in Charleston from the fourth busiest to the twelfth busiest in the country. Um, if we don't do something about that, we're going to continue to lose more jobs. So I am in favor of that. We just need to be smart with the tax money that we have. Thank you. Right, thank you. Now for House District 10, the incumbent Joshua Putnam. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've got to give, right now we have a broken system. So we got to give these incentives to lure businesses to our state. We need these jobs. But it's a red flag, just like you mentioned. I mean, why, why, whenever we have to give out these million-dollar packages, shouldn't we ask ourselves, why are we having to do that? Shouldn't that be a red flag? You know what? Maybe our taxes are a little too high here. Why don't we look to some fair, some equal system where 
Every business is on an equal playing field. Well, we don't have to give incentives to different companies. They just come here to South Carolina because we're number one business friendly state in the country. Um, the state house, we have, I think, close to seven different tax restructuring bills that we're working on right now. And I was able to be a part of that this past October um, down in the state house, going to meetings, I'm hearing about it to re to start the process of changing our tax structure. I think that's what we got to move to. Time. All right, thanks, sir. And uh, Challenger and Johnson. Folks, we wouldn't be the largest exporter of automobiles and the largest tire manufacturer in the country if it weren't for tax incentives. It's plain and simple. Our tax code's what it is. This is the hand that we're dealt, so we need to offer the incentives in order to draw the industry in. I just feel that it's important to make it a business friendly environment to create large groups of jobs. And the thing is, I think what's real important is set benchmarks. In other words, if XYZ company wants to come to South Carolina and they promise 1,500 jobs within a given period of time, well, by golly, they better have 1,500 jobs. If they don't, it reverts back. That's part of the transparency. I think that's where we're missing this right now is, is that we aren't holding these companies accountable that don't do what they say they're going to do. If they do what they say they're going to do, the incentives are effective. That's what we don't have right now. So those are things we need to address, but I do believe we need the incentives in order to move forward. Thank you. Now to our next question, starting with uh, the incumbent Senator Kevin Bryant. Do you support voter registration by party in closed primaries in South Carolina? Yes, absolutely, and I'll tell you why. In Anderson County, how many Democrats voted, uh, filed? Maybe one or two? We are a Republican-controlled county, and I'm glad for it. But we don't need Democrats choosing who our nominee is going to be. If they want to run as a Democrat, run as a Democrat. If they want to file as a Republican and register by a Republican, we'd love to have them. But too many times in counties like ours, Democrats come over and meddle in our business. This is a... This is an election to select the Republican nominee, our standard bearer, and I don't think Democrats have any business voting in our primary, so absolutely I support registration by party. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Challenger Don Bowen Jr. Uh, I agree with that, and I think that in some ways Senator Bryant might be uh, referencing me as a possible Democrat, I'm not sure. Um, I actually voted for Senator Bryant during the last election. Um, I'm a Republican. My Republican views are the views that I define myself as a Republican. As you can see, I'm not a, a common man, I guess, according to the Republican credo. Um, people have different views within the same party. As a Republican, I have different views from Senator Bryant within this party, and that's why I'm running against him. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator um, Billy O'Dell, but once again, the question is, do you support voter registration by party in closed primaries? Uh, Lee, I do support that, and, and I think that, um, that that's a good, as my, my colleague has expressed, that's a good reason to uh, keep people in the same party from voting. I mean, if, if we're going to have Democrats voting in the primaries, then it really doesn't give you a true indication of, of what the average Republican wants. I would support that uh, that we register by party, if that's what you're asking. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. All right, Challenger Riley Marvell. I uh, don't believe in being long-winded, so I'll just say that I agree with the three others who spoke, and I'm in favor of voter registration by party and closing the primaries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now for um, District 8 incumbent Don Bowen Sr., I believe that we should register by parties. I always take, I get the voter vault, and I go through and look at everybody that's running, and I go back and look what elections they voted in. And you'll be surprised what you find. You'll find people that say that they're a Republican that vote in a Democratic primary. Now, how can you do that if you're a Republican? I vote in every Republican primary. I voted in every election as a Republican. And I stand here on the record that I voted as a Republican. And I think we should be registered by party. We should out those people who go over on the other side and vote in different primaries to skew the election, to skew and pick your candidates. We need to pick our own candidates, and the other side needs to pick theirs. Thank you. Thank you. 
challenge, Challenger Ted Luckett. I certainly agree with what I've been saying by each and every gentleman. My, my question to this is we need to get to all Republicans to come out and vote. That's something we don't do enough of in, in this county, in this state. Uh, you know, people don't exercise their right to vote. And we as Republicans need to get out and, and get the message out to, to, to use your vote. Because if you don't vote, you don't have a say. Thank you. Great, thank you. Challenger Jonathan Walker. I do agree that uh, with uh, Ted, what he just said. I've got a good friend who likes to complain about uh, the elected officials in office right now, and uh, he's not registered to vote. And I uh, fuss at him all the time and say, I don't want to hear a word from you until you register to vote and go place your vote. <laughs> I don't want to get that. But, um, <laughs> so I do believe that they should register by party. Thank you. Thank you. District 10, we come to Joshua Putnam. I, absolutely. Why should this even be a question here? I mean, if you have a problem running on a Republican ticket, adhering to the conservative values, why are you here? I mean, really. And we got to really, and I've run in several elections, like I mentioned before. And what we do, what I do, is after an election, we pull all the records. Then we run through our database. Do you know there's been elections I've been in and we've had over 10% Democrats come out and vote when there's only Republicans on a ticket? That's, that's unacceptable. But the problem is, down in General Assembly, there's only a few of us where we actually came up and they were saying, said, yes, we want to close it. And then the overwhelming majority said, no, it would hurt us down the lower part of the state. And that's where we got it. We got to keep conservatives in office who understand the value and importance of closing our primaries. And then we need to work. We need to set the fire to the other members down in Columbia that all feel our way. Let's say, you know what, I've got to have Democrats help me. I, I do not accept that at all. You do not need a Democrat to help you. To help you. Thank you, and Challenger Hamp Johnson. How many times have we heard presidential primaries specifically, presidential elections, that Democrats cross over and hijack mm -hmm. the potential nominee? There's the, that's one of the main reasons why we absolutely have to have this. We've got Democrats determining, potentially determining, who our presidential nominees are. So we not, not only have this on the local level, but we have it on the federal level too as well. All right, thank you. All right, and the fourth and final question in this segment right here, this will be a very simple one, um, and I doubt if you'll all need the, the full minute to go because I'm basically looking for a yes or no answer. I'm not trying to give a specific time limit uh, on what I'm about to mention, but I would like to know how you feel in concept about your support for term limits for state legislators. I'm not trying to tie anybody down to a specific number of terms or anything, so let's not get caught up in the details, but the concept of term limits for state legislators, do you agree or disagree? I, I agree with term limits. However, I will not impose term limits on myself. As Senator Odell will tell you, Everything in the Senate is based on seniority. However, there's a bill I've co-sponsored and will continue to support term limits, but the way the Senate structure is now, and we're going to have to change the structure of the Senate rules if we do impose term limits, and I would be in favor of both of those. All right, thank you. Challenger Don Bowen Jr. I believe that um, the term limits first, you, you have to have enough candidates running for office uh, before you can impose term limits. We've got a lot of unopposed uh, candidates running for re-election this time around. And before we can even put term limits in place, uh, we, need to, we need to ignite the political base and get more people out and get them involved in politics so that if we were to move to a term limits uh, solution, we'll have uh, good candidates to choose from. So if we can get more, you know, more people out there running, fewer people uh, running unopposed, then yes, I'm in favor of term limits. All right, thank you. This uh, Senate District 4, the incumbent Billy O'Dell. Uh, I would not favor term limits, primarily for the reason that my colleague said. Uh, the Senate is governed by the seniority system, and is, the longer you're there, the more you can help your district. And uh, that I, I would not favor term limits. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Challenger Riley Harbell. I am in favor of term limits. Um, I guess I'm going to break the chain and go ahead and point out that uh, Senator Odell has served for 24 years. He's done a great job over 24 years, uh, but in my opinion, I believe 24 years is enough. Um, you didn't say what to, to specify what, how long 
Um, but I can certainly say that if, if you can retire from the military, you can retire as a teacher in 20 years, then 20 years in the legislature is certainly plenty of time. Um, but I also agree that we don't have enough people running for office. I, I was talking with Representative Putnam earlier, and I said that I believe that any unopposed election is a wasted election. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Thayer. But I, I do. I believe that the people should have a choice. And one of the main reasons that I'm running is because I believe that the voters in my district re re deserve a choice. And I hope all for that. All right, thank you. And Riley, since you were the first one to invoke the name of your opponent, I'm going to give uh, Senator Odell uh, some time to respond. Yeah, just I really don't need any time. That's fine. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> just wanted to be fair about it because that was the rules. Uh, now for uh, uh, for uh, incumbent Don Bowen Sr. from uh, District A. I really don't have any problem with term limits. I think that uh, we need to keep that place churning and flushed like you do a toilet for the same reason down there. <laughs> I have, I, I have opposition every time because I'm so vocal out there. So I have term, I have the option of term limits in every election cycle. So I have no problem with it. I'm on, I'm on, I'm ready to campaign at any given moment on any given day. So I have no problem with term limits if everybody wants to put them on. I think after ten years in the house is enough, and then you need to bump your senator up, let him move on to Washington. We need, we need to keep. Keep it flushed and keep it moved and flush Washington out too. Thank you. Thank you. Challenger, Ted, look at it. I certainly agree with, with term limits, uh, and I think the people will speak for term limits. They do that every time we have an election. They, if they're not happy with that person, I don't care how long they've been there, they can they can take care of that themselves. Uh, Riley, it's 28 years before you can retire as a teacher. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Are you going to make me invoke the, uh, the rebuttal rule there? <laughs> okay. All right, Jonathan Walker. Um, I am not in favor of term limits like Mr. Odell was talking about. Um, I believe if, if you want to change, you've got to stand up there and uh, run for office, and that's what I'm doing. I believe there's a change. It needs to be a change, and uh, that's why I'm running. So I'm not in favor of term limits. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now for District 10, incumbent Joshua Putnam. Well, the Constitution says that you're the term limits. Every single time you vote, you're the term limit. So if you have a problem with people up here being in office too long, we only have ourselves to blame for that. Yeah. I mean, every single time you go to vote, you're taking up the responsibility of checking that box and enlisting term limits. Um, the problem I do see with term limits, though, is you're going to give control to lobbyists like crazy in Columbia. I feel that we don't really pay too much attention for that. However, what we do need, we need transparency. That's what we don't have. That's the reason why we don't know people's records very well. That's the reason why they can stay in office for so long. Because we don't know who they are. We don't know how they vote. They don't, we don't know how they represent us. So what we need is we need a better informed voting demographic. And you do that by transparency. Everything needs to be, be out there and open. And then use the Constitution. Vote. All right, thank you. And Challenger Hemp Johnson. I'm for term limits as long as Gil and Kyle Hunter and Harry Ott and Democrats like that are for term limits. Why should we term limit, why should good people term limit themselves if the dogs are still out there in the General Assembly? That's my point. If we've got folks like that that are not, are not willing to term limit themselves, why should the good folks term limit themselves? If it's passed by the entire General Assembly, absolutely. But let's get rid of the, let's get rid of all the bad apples. Not just let them pick and choose who, who term limits themselves and who doesn't. All right, thank you. And I just wanted to remind you of the way things are going to go. At, uh, in just a moment, I'll allow the um, candidates here to have some closing remarks. There'll be one minute for closing remarks for each of them. Uh, obviously, we're going to have a little bit of time of fellowship here for just a moment. And folks, if you have um, not written down your questions, please go ahead and do so. Uh, and those will be taken up shortly. And then we'll uh, take a look at those and try and get a few of those questions in. Uh, we'll have probably about 20 minutes, uh, if we have enough questions, where we'll go that. Um, and then after that, uh, I would invite all these candidates, obviously, to stick around a little bit more if they had uh, some personal time to spend with you and talking individually. I'm not trying to lock anybody into that, but we would hope that you would be able to stay for a little while longer, so we'll try to get through that. But at this time, we'll have closing remarks. We'll start with incumbent Senator uh, Kevin Bryant. One minute. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate this opportunity to be here. Like I said, I began my political activity as a conservative activist. Conservative act activist 
require, demand a conservative voting record. I have a crystal clear conservative voting record. I have a record of fighting. I have a record of taking on the leadership. And I will continue to do so should you choose to send me back to Columbia. I appreciate your attention, and I would really appreciate your consideration to, to support this campaign. I'm not asking for you to vote for Kevin. I'm asking you to look at my record and see if it represents your values, and I believe it will. Thank you. Senator Senator Bryant, I'm not asking you to vote for me. I'm asking you to vote for what you believe in and the candidate who most uh, reflects the views that you have. I'm a dad. I've got uh, children who are attending school, and that's the greatest difference between me and Senator Bryant. I believe in American public school education in this country, and I'm not so sure that Senator Bryant does. I ask for your vote on June 12th, and if anyone has any questions, Feel free to get in touch with me. I'll answer all of them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now for Senate District 4, incumbent Billy O'Dell. Thank you, Lee. Um, again, I'm here asking for your support. Uh, you've been kind to me and honored me for the past six terms that I've been elected. Uh, now, this wasn't my only job. I ran a successful business for 40 years. I retired in 2002. My children run the business now and uh, they're doing a much better job than I did. I'm very proud of them. And uh, I would like to continue my service. I have the time to put in, and I will work for economic, uh, for our economic future, because we have got to continue to bring industry into the state if we're ever going to move forward. We've got a lot of problems. I think we can solve them. We have to continue to work. Thank you again for your attendance. Thanks, sir. And challenger, Riley Harvell. I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, I'm running on three words, and that's family, freedom, and future. The three F's, I like alliteration. The family, my family's standing in the back. My children have been screaming this entire time um, because they're very unhappy with me for bringing them. But I bring them because I believe that they should participate in the democratic process the same way my father believed that I should. From a young age, I sat in these pews. Well, actually, we were in different places. But uh, I participated in conservative activism like Senator Bryan talked about. Our freedoms, I believe that our freedoms are at stake here in this election. We're talking about regulation from the government. We're talking about a higher tax burden. We're talking about overwhelming unemployment. These are freedoms, basic freedoms that every human, every South Carolinian should enjoy. And we talk about our future. We talk about my future, my children's future, and who best should look out for those. Someone who is starting their way in life, someone who has their entire lives ahead of them. My children will go through public schools. I'll build a business here. I'm running to represent Senate District 4 because I believe that I have a solution for our future. Thank you. And now for House Girl of South Carolina House District 8, the incumbent Don Bowen Sr. I would appreciate your support as well. I, I take on a kind of different tack from the rest of the gang down there. I actually represent the people who live out there in House District 8. And a lot of times even my delegation gets a little irritated with me with some of the stuff that I put forward down there. But the people that I represent want me to, so why shouldn't I? It's not about me, it's about we. It's about what we can do together to make our community a better place to live. I'm 67 years old and I'm not trying to do anything for up the road for myself because I'm already there. I really and sincerely want to make our community a better place to live and with the help of each one of you, we can. Thank you. Thank you. And challenger Ted Luckaday. I uh, grew up in a mill village up in North Carolina, and uh, so I, with my humble beginning, I feel strongly the fact that the core values that I had growing up, that I continued to those when, in the 40 years of education that I had as far as a, a teacher, a coach, and athletic director. I want to take those same values to Columbia. And I, want to, I want to be a good listener. I want to be a hard worker, and I want to make decisions. Just go common, common plain, common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Challenger Jonathan Walker. Thank you again for coming. Um, first, let me say any support uh, would be greatly appreciated since I am new to the political realm. Um, let me begin by saying that we have a lot of issues facing Anderson County and one the economy. We have a 12.6% unemployment rate, which is very high. We've got to create jobs. Like I said, small business is the best way to do that. Um, the schools, we've got to restructure the schools, and we've got to also restructure the government. 
we got a lot of wasted positions in the government that are useless, and that's uh, tax dollars going going to waste. And I'm here to work for everyone sitting out here tonight and uh, try to be smart with the money we have and uh, make smart decisions. And any support would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And now for House District 10, incumbent Joshua Putnam. Once again, it's, it's been an honor to serve you these past few months in the General Assembly down in Columbia. Um, it's, it's not a job I take lightly. Um, every single night I go to bed before the next day's session and read over the bills that are going to be on the calendar. So I'm well prepared for what's going to come the next day. Um, I mean, my, since I started this fight two years ago, the reason why I got into it is because my future family, where would I want to raise them? What type of state and what type of country would I want to raise them in? I wasn't seeing my views and my values being represented in Columbia. I wasn't seeing anybody taking, taking the strong, courageous stand in Columbia for the conservative values. That's the reason why I got into it two years ago. We've had, there's going to be five elections in two years, so hopefully that shows you that I'm never willing down, never willing to back down from a fight, no, how, no matter how large or whatever the odds are stacked up against me. I think we need strong, courageous men. I think we need uh, an office. But thank you, and keep me in your prayers more than anything. Thank you, and Challenger Hank Johnson. You know, as someone that works with small business owners, manufacturers on a daily basis, I see what is going on. I've seen how unemployment taxes have gone up. I've seen how they've had to make decisions whether they have to pay these additional expenses or hire new people. These are things that I see that are going on within our state, within our communities, and those are things that I want to change. Cutting the waste first and foremost will be at the top of my agenda. As long as we do that, our tax cuts will then be more effective. <coughs> And one thing I'd ask out of all of us up here tonight, every one of us, y'all know how hard this is. Going out, knocking on doors, talking to people, chasing zingers, you know, all these things that are about to happen to us in this campaign. Keep us in your thoughts and prayers because we're going to need them. All right, thank you. And that concludes this segment. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time for some fellowship. We'll take about a 15-minute break. And, uh, gentlemen, if you'll join us back up here, and I'll try to give you a two-minute warning as we get uh, back to the next round. And folks, if you have your questions, be sure to turn those into the young ladies that are taking those up, please.